just a few quick words about where am I, because if you open the program, you can see the title uh, Marketing Manager. Uh, I hate talks from marketing people, but I'm actually a C++ developer before JetBrains. I spent um, eight years in embedded networking, telecom development. I was launching 4G, LT networks, all this kind of uh, cool stuff uh, was in my background, but then I joined JetBrains as a C++ tools product marketing manager, like developer advocate, product marketing manager, all kind of stuff. So, yep. Uh, and you can reach out to me via Twitter if you have anything, just uh, let me know there. And also, if you're somewhere around Amsterdam where I'm currently living, join the C++ Dutch user group. It's awesome. We do host it quite often in JetBrains and also in other places. And we have nice audience. We're open for speakers or just visitors. Anyway, so. C++, um, standard tool set, so do we really have it? So let's start from the a little bit far away. So let's look at the frustrating points we have in C++. And this is the data from the C++ Foundation Light Survey 2023. I kind of highlighted um, a little bit. The green things are the things which are unchanged for two, three, four years there. The uh, pink, uh, like, Highlighted in pinks are the things which actually moved to the top uh, in 2023. And like, yeah, the, the rest are just unchanged. So uh, take a look and realize that the biggest pain points in C++ are still around tooling. So these, these are the things unchanged for many years, like managing libraries is the first frustration, biggest frustration point for the majority of the C++ developers since uh, what time the C++ Foundation started actually doing the survey. So it's on top. Uh, build times is also there, like CI pipelines, development environments. So the people do suffer uh, in this um, aspect. And so let's see actually why, because the rest you see, like the, the language, the typical safety issues, yes, some of them uh, actually moved to the top this year, but generally they are in the second part of the table. So they are also important for many people for sure, because the people do uh, care about the um, safety, type safety and all these things in C++ and how to do them correctly. But the biggest frustration points are regarding the tooling. So let's figure out what is actually the tool set. So let's just uh, put the definition here so that we're all on the same page. So there are essential tools in the tool set and they're like complementary <coughs> tools. Essentially, uh, essential tools are the tools without which you, you can't develop. Like you can't develop without a compiler, right? So you know, uh, you, you need to compile at some certain point of uh, your development um, timeline and like you need maybe some libraries, you need maybe the debugger. I usually put it to the essential tools, but if you ask like Rust developers, they will tell you, no, it's like complementary tooling. Uh, I prefer to put it to the essential list, like uh, build system or the project models and like dependency management, at least to some extent, even if you just cook it uh, manually, it's also essential. Complementary tools, which are nice to have, but you can kind of survive without them, but maybe that will be like uh, a huge pain is like the static analyzer or dynamic analyzer. It can be like testing frameworks and all these kind of coverage, profiling, whatever tooling. So it's good to have them, right? So you can survive without them, but it's better to have them. So let's a brief look at what other languages have so that we understand where the C++ is at. Um, I won't be talking about uh, in details about this tool set, but just a brief uh, sneak peek. So Java has kind of standard compiler. It has a huge Java class library with all sorts of things you need, actually, you can find there. And it has more or less standard uh, project models build systems. So there are a few of them, but uh, there are like very, like two strong uh, options there. And like, yeah, they have the kind of default um, unit testing frameworks and all these things. So with Java, yeah, mostly when you start with Java, you just take the standard things and you use them. Ruby, if you look at this uh, language, has actually several compilers, but they are very much different because they all using like different um, philosophy of like compiler, you know, different approaches to the compilers. That's the funny thing that actually Ruby community, they re really have different types of compiling approaches implemented in their compiler. And I like their like uh, Rails test. If you haven't heard about the ra Rails singularity, that's a fantastic thing. They have this very famous framework called Ruby on Rails. 
And the good compiler, the compiler which is trusted by the community, is the compiler uh, which could actually uh, you know, run this, compile this Ruby on Rails successfully. So it's just a basic test for every compiler. But generally, they, they have different approaches. They all work for them, so the people could select between like JIT or interpreter approaches and other things. They have their Ruby games uh, for like, say, uh, package management. They have like unit testing frameworks. Yeah, so kind of standard uh, tool set. The tool set, which is definitely a standard one, is the one like, you know, maintained by Apple for Swift. The, the, there is no question, like you get the compiler from Apple, you get the whole tool chain from Apple, you get the source kit, uh, which is like the LSP, the analyzer, you get the debugger, and they even like, this is all LVM based, but the tool chain is patched by Apple. So the clank you get uh, from Apple is not the mainstream clank. The LDB you get from Apple is not the mainstream LDB. So all these sort of things. But they definitely show that their tool chain wor is working for their languages, uh, their language fantastically. And they have like um, SPM. They also had cacao pods, especially in the past when they it was just Objective C. But it looks like the more people are going to the SPM right now, which is the standard tooling from Apple. Okay, which language is closer to C++? You may ask where is Rust, yes? So Rust has a standard compiler. It has the fantastic Cargo uh, build system project model. So you don't have questions like how to start a new project with Rust, right? So you have Cargo, you have uh, Rust C. And that's it. They have like things like standard formatter or Rust analyzer. They uh, kind of debug with println and macros because debugging in Rust has some issues. They don't have a decent debugger, uh, but they have all other sorts of things. They have uh, this fantastic crates, which uh, provides them with all the dependencies, all the libraries they need. And when you start with Rust, even the, while like the Rust can be painful because of some like Rust philosophy and you might not get them from their beginning, but the tool chain is the point where you don't have any questions. It's very straightforward. So C++, <laughs> you know, uh, it's different. But does the C++, uh, like does the standard tool set really matter? So what it brings us, what's the benefits actually? Uh, first of all, a very simple one is that it helps the newbies, those who are coming to the language and they don't know how to start with the language, don't let them struggle with the tool set, right? So give them something, they will start, they, they still have a huge language ahead of them, that will be enough. So, but apart from newbies, does it really help other people like professional developers who are with C++ for years? Actually, yes, because when you have a standard tool set, onboarding becomes much easier, right? So you can prepare the pre cook environment with every tool set set up which you use in your project. And when a new person is coming to the project, you just say, okay, go there, take that environment, like say Docker container or something else, and everything will be there. The Docker, Docker is probably the most popular way just to pack all this tool set and say like, yeah, just download it and like launch this container and everything will be there for you. Uh, it of course helps with some code unification and like you can make the code uh, like look uh, like yeah unified uh, sorry for repetition and you can easily easier adopt the best practices when you have the standard tool set right because you can just apply them to to this specific tool set and you don't have to think about many options and yeah, of course, like uh, the biggest point we have is for sharing libraries, the standard tool set kind of help you when you just know where to take the libraries. Because this is the most popular question every C++ developer at some point of their life ask is how to take the library. So how, how to do that? How can I connect, say, I want to use Google test, how to do that? So where, where to take it? So how to connect it to my project? Should I compile it with my project, really? Um, so let's talk about the variety. Is variety is really good or bad? Because I don't think it's always bad. I mean, like uh, it has some uh, benefits and let's see what actually we have in C++ and what are the uh, pros and cons. So the compilers. So we have actually more than these four, this just the, the major names, you know, and even Intel now is like Intel and Intel LLVM. And there are also a huge family of GCC based compilers for embedded developers. So there are a huge list here behind these four names. All compilers usually um, are different in two main aspects. So first of all is that they generate different assembly, which means different performance. Yes, so you can't rely on the performance after one compiler if you take another compiler. 
And also it's different in um, error reporting. So the, the readability level, the digitalization is like different. And there are lots of interesting articles across the internet. I think some of you may have uh, seen that when the people do compare, say, GCC and Clang and MSVC and like who wins if we take these like aspects and see how the error reporting looks for them, like saying uh, missing things or index out of bounds or forgetting some, I don't know, return statements. So the compilers behave and reports differently. And you can get used to one reporting uh, approach, but then you take another compiler and you completely misunderstand what's going on there. What's the error? Like, show me that error I had there. I know what it means. Uh, the thing which um, vendor to uh, those who are creating tooling for C++ often uh, made is that you probably have heard, or maybe if not, so if you want to get the compiler predefined macros, which is crucial if you want to understand how to parse the code correctly, how to build the correct AST, which, uh, for example, IDEs most of the time are doing, they're building the AST for your code. For GCC Clang, the approach is very much unified. So there is the same command, which gives you the same output, and you just parse it the same way for GCC and Clang. But if you try to do that for MSVC, First of all, they didn't uh, have a proper way of doing that for a very long time. This comment I have here appeared not that long time ago, and you still have to combine it with some heuristic approach, so it's not that straightforward. So if you want to simply get the compiler predefined macros out of the compiler, you can do it the similar way from GCC and Clang, but MSVC will be different. Uh, another example is the syntax style. You know, what I kind of like and hate about the C++ is that you can do one thing in 10 different ways. And uh, when some people ask me like, can you, for example, search for code duplicates in my code in your tooling? I say, hell yes, but write them in the same syntax style because you can do that completely different in C++. And there are like just a few examples here, say uh, almost outer approach or when the people try to put the type uh, in most of the cases or like the, you know, simple const west is battle, even these things are different. Uh, trailing return type when they uh, appeared for lambdas, the people say like, should we use them just for lambdas or everywhere? It also changed, um, like can change from one code base to another code base. And even the guidelines sometimes do recommend the completely different thing, like the uh, virtual usage word is different in the Unreal Engine guidelines, which is the biggest engine for a game development, and in the C++ core guidelines, for example. They do recommend the completely different things to, to be used in the code. They have reasons for that, of course, but yeah, the thing is that the syntax style could be very different. I would show you this uh, huge table. Actually, that's just a part of the table. It's not all. This is the settings we implemented in our like tooling in Resharper C++ to give people an ability to configure the C++ syntax style. So you see the whole table doesn't fit into what slide is huge. So you can configure all these types of things. And these things could be different. So, and in one code base, the one will be like the standard approach. In another code base, the people will be doing completely different thing. And the people comment from one job, say, to another, say like, how to do the code here? So how to use outer here? Where to put the cons here? Am I putting it on the right side? Or like, will they just like, you know, remove me from the team because I'm putting it on the wrong side? Um, all these things matter. And sometimes you can do some nice stuff when you can say, uh, implement some automatic conversion, like we try to help people to do in the tool, and like, for example, uh, move this return type to the trailing return type. But sometimes it's uh, not a matter of the tooling, it's a matter of like, what's the standard. So, okay, what, what's the standard? Where are we now? C++ standard tool set. I remember this fantastic picture from the Bryce talk. It was at C++ Now. He was talking about the C++ library, and he was showing how many um, aspects the C++ and the C++ library is now covering and I think it applicable to the talk of the C++ tool set as well because you see that C++ is for any problem, any paradigm and any platform. So it's everywhere. So because of that probably the single um, standard tool set is not simply possible. Yeah, so you can't unify to that extent. Um, 
we had this interesting question, what is this standard C++ tool set back in 2015 when we started doing our C++ tools in JetBrains, we realized that the tooling is like, it has a huge variety in C++ and we need to select something which we'll implement first. Because when you start an ID, you need to start with some like uh, basic tool set, like say, take the compiler, the project model and the debugger, implement the support for them and then go forward, go for the others. So we did uh, some kind of a survey, we did some kind of a research, uh, and we figured out that we'll go with GCC, CMake, and GDB. It changed dramatically since that, the clank started growing, uh, but yeah, at least at that time we, we got some answer we could start with. But the others were quite close, I mean the, the other combinations were close, and the combinations were dependent on the platform, I mean like literally on Apple platform, the uh, LVM, the LDB toolset was, was the major one. So it was already uh, clear to us that it won't be uh, you know, a simple battle. <laughs> so talking about the compilers, so um, a bit more nice pictures with compilers. So as I said, there are many compilers behind that uh, name that I showed previously. So there are lots of like uh, embedded compilers. There are different, and they're actually different. They have different uh, speed of support in the C++ uh, language features. So I'm not even talking about like how GCC is different from Clang, but like take a look at the embedded compilers, how soon they get the new language features and you can get your answer. But so what's the usage? So you know that we are kind of keen of doing the surveys. I was doing a small lightning talk yesterday about that. So uh, we asked our, um, like our respondents what compilers they're using. And this is the data we get from the, our developer ecosystem 2022 survey and also from the C++ Foundation um, 2023 survey. So um, for sure the compiler depends on the default of the operational system. So like GCC is more popular on Linux like or Clang is more popular on Mac OS. Um, like Windows is different and depends on what you do. Say if you're doing the game development, the tool set for you will be like MSVC plus uh, MS Build plus whatever from Microsoft. It's usually the default. If you're doing embedded, like it's something like GCC or IR or the scale or Green Hills or whatever, there are many names there. Um, it's also interesting that like Intel now has this old Intel and new Intel if I may call it that way, like new Intel is the Intel LVM based. Uh, and it's interesting that there is also Clang CL. We put it as a separate option in developer ecosystem because it's actually not really Clang. It, it is Clang, but it's different. So um, because it's like uh, rely on the Windows age and actually on the Windows ecosystem. So and you can see that uh, generally, yeah, the GCC is uh, probably more popular for especially for embedded. MSVC is mostly trending for game dev people and uh, yeah, foundation gets more results for MSVC, but I guess that's because they actually get more uh, Windows specific people, game developers, and you can see that from their audience. Uh, talking about other differences of the com between the compilers and um, have you ever like yeah, tried to find the universal way of how to enable all the warnings and convert them to errors? Just if you're again on GCC and Clang, that's very straightforward. We all know that mantra V O V extra. Uh, but if you're on like Microsoft compiler, you have the different uh, options. And I've seen this code in CMake many times. Like when the people in CMake they have because the CMake is kind of this cross-platform universal, you know, um, project model generator build generator, and the people put this uh, huge uh, if branches for a compiler is trying to compile the things properly. And you have to do that, otherwise it won't be compiled correctly. Um, talking about the compatibility with the standard, let's just look at how uh, the recent C++ 23 features come into the standard look in the compiler. You can see like the, the first three columns is GCC, Clang, and MSVC. Uh, you can see it's different. Okay, well, that's C++ 23. You can say, what's about C++ 20? They should be more or less aligned, right? So let's take the three major features from C++ 20. Uh, I don't think that's the alignment. <laughs> I think the situation is completely different. And for many years, actually, before C++ 20, Clang was trending and was ahead of others in terms of implementing the new language features. But somehow it happened that with C++ 20, the speed of adoption of the new features decreased for Clang. 
And while, like, say, the concept prototypes was done by uh, SAR quite quickly, but it was merged quite late to the uh, to, to the to the clank like uh, mainstream. And the model is I'm not talking about them at all. It's a complex thing about like how they got the support. So you see that the compilers they are different a lot, even in these basic things of just supporting the standard. And you have to take this into account when you are moving uh, between the compilers or between the versions. The interesting thing is that Clang is actually much more than a compiler. It's beyond the compiler. It's the whole ecosystem right now. So LLVM, it's like the compiler. It's the lib Clang. It's the daemon uh, Clang D, which is now used uh, quite often by the modern tooling, including the IDEs. We also do use it a lot. Uh, it's like an LSP, and also it provides all this analysis via the Clang analyzer or the Clang tidy, which is like the most popular analyzer. We'll talk about it later. Uh, Clank format, it's not exactly like the Clank. Uh, it has some fuzzy parts here, but still it's part of the ecosystem. So every tool that literally needs an AST, they usually try to move to Clank. And I know uh, many tools who in the past were trying to do their own parser, but in the end, they at least partially, like we uh, did, move to Clank. So you still ke can keep your in-house parser, but to get this uh, pace of the new language features adoption, you still kind of implement some support for Clang. And it's actually good for that. I mean, there is a huge effort in the community to make Clang applicable for, for tools, for querying the EST, not just to be the compiler. And I have a few, I had a few talks in the past when I was explaining how the compiler actually is different from, from parser in these kind of tools. And it's different things. But Clang is good for that. So it's the basis for many C++ tools these days, like, you can love it or hate it, but it's the fact. Okay, project models. Uh, that, that's tough. You know, uh, there is kind of no single project model. While we have some winners <laughs> in this race for the years, uh, it's definitely CMake, which is uh, winning the race. And it has, uh, like, for our, for our surveys, it's like 57% in foundation when they ask you know to select all applicable options and the people like try to select as many as they can it's even 80 percent so it's big it's growing it took the first uh, place from um, ms build from microsoft build system several years ago i would say about five or six and it's still growing and i see a huge effort of uh, like people coming to cmake so actually, yeah, that's how, how it looked like. So uh, you see it was growing and at some point of time it uh, overgrew the uh, MS belt. And actually, yeah, again, I will refer to Bryce who said at C++ now that if you want a standard C++ build system, you got one, it's called CMake, that's it, yeah. Uh, actually, not exactly true because if you take the game developers, they will tell you, oh, no, we have MS build, this is our standard build system. And if you take embedded developers, they will be like, uh, kinda, we're still on make files, maybe move into CMake. So it's not that uh, black and white, of course. If you look, however, at the CMake adoption, you can see that the way it's growing is really uh, impressive because first of all, like yeah, there are libraries, there are IDs, and there are package managers now focused around CMake. Yeah, so like VC package generates CMake, many IDEs support CMake, many libraries try to it provides the CMake support to get better adoption for the library. That's nearly the golden standard. So if you want your library to be used, put a CMake there. Uh, even Qt, with their like favorite QMake, started some migration to CMake in the end. Embedded developers are also migrating to CMake, actually. They are not stuck with make files now. So Zephyr Airtos migrated to CMake, which was a huge move. Uh, it's an open source real-time operation system um, from the Linux Foundation. If you don't know, and it's used in uh, many, many things. If you um, like ever um, see embedded developers, they're quite often using the, uh, the Freer toss and Zephyr toss. Also, like Nordic Semiconductor, they moved to CMake for their SDK. And Nordic Semiconductor is actually, if you ever like have the uh, mouth with the Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth, quite likely you'll have a Nordic semiconductor chip in it. So they're, they're everywhere. And they moved the whole um, SDK to the CMake several years ago. So another thing is this uh, like effort to make Boost CMake uh, friendly. I don't think they succeeded, but like, yeah, Boost is a tough, uh, 
tough thing, but uh, at least uh, there are people who are trying to, to help. There are many files that help you with the building Boost with CMake, but it's not the native CMake for the Boost library, of course. But the big thing which changed the world, I think, was the CMake file API. This is the black box which you can ask CMake about which files are in the projects, which, what are the libraries, what are the compiler options, all the kind of things you might need. And you not now like launching the CMake itself, but you just ask it via this uh, file API. And it's awesome, they do support it and they keep it up to date. And now the tooling can just query the CMake file API and it will work like a charm. And of course the CMake presets, uh, which simplify the way you do configuration in CMake. And that was a huge effort, I guess, some collaboration between Kitware and Microsoft, who was struggling with that. Uh, I guess this is a good way now to, to use the CMake and to, con uh, to configure it properly. There are even more. CMake, you probably have heard about it, is a tough language. So uh, it's, it's an awful language, I will be honest. So it's hard to learn. It does all kinds of creepy stuff with the strings. If you ever want to understand how awful it is, take the nice talk by Mateusz from EPAM, again from C++ Now, where he was doing like quizzes for CMake. The talk was called like uh, CMake plus Conan, but the first part of the talk is dedicated to the CMake quiz. I guess I won one question out of it. I know CMake for years. So it's like all kinds of things, how you can use the strings, how you can use the numbers or the booleans. Uh, who created the bullets in CMake? I just want to, to meet this person because like it's not just you know true and false just for you to know Anyway, so you know what is was the most fantastic feature? We uh, added in C line and I know Visual Studio added it later as well and even um, Contributed and upstream it to CMake is the CMake debugger Have you ever heard that at one point of your life? You will be debugging the build system the project model now you have an opportunity. It's nice It's a building debugger you can use in like C line or Visual Studio or just purely um, in CMake because I guess it's upstream in 3.27 the um, Contribution from the Microsoft was upstream to the uh, upcoming CMake version. So there is a debugger for the CMake. There is even a profiler for the CMake. So you can profile CMake. Uh, we integrated that into like C line. So this is a screenshot from the C line. So you can actually see what takes time. It profiles the CMake step, not, not the building step. So the exactly execution of the CMake, what actually takes time for you. Um, okay. So let's um, talk a little bit about CMake and Modulus and their nice friendship <laughs> because um, the language feature adoption relies a lot on how the tooling adopts it. And there was the first step like which everyone was waiting for is like to bring Modulus to the standard. It happened and then like, okay, can we use it? No, we need compilers to support it, right? Okay, then we got some compilers who supported the Modulus. Can we use it? Still no, because there is no project model, you can do like, you know, manual uh, compilation of your model, passing the arguments to the command line, but on a big project to migrate to models, there's um, no way to do that. So everyone was waiting for the ecosystem to support it. Uh, CMake brought some very first implementation. Uh, it was just uh, adding some creepy executables and just compiling the models as it's like the regular C++ files. They improved later with some code which was not uh, really readable and straightforward, but you can, um, it, it was just the second iteration for CMake how to support models. It was still very much looking like you're compiling the regular C++ files and you can't get from reading the CMake code that you're actually compiling a model unless you just, you know, name some variable model there. Um, it's a better way now. Uh, so there is at least uh, some specific um, variables for that which you can set. It still looks to me a little bit like I'm compiling some C++ files and uh, project model is not uh, exactly aware that I'm doing the work with Modulus, but uh, at least it works. So there are some examples by the links here which are working. Moreover, the important step was that in 3.26, they added support for Modulus to the fi file API I was talking about before. So now you can query CMake file API and ask like what are the Modulus, which files belong there. And that's very important because now that means that the tooling, say IDs and others, can properly support Modulus based on this file API. 
Um, okay, talking about the dependencies, um, as I said, that's a major pain point for the C++ developers. And you can see that uh, if you ask C++ developers how they manage dependencies in C++, uh, the trend for C++ foundation results in Diveka is the same. They just have, in the foundation, they have just bigger numbers. But generally, the majority of people have it like part of their build. So they just put their libraries into their project and do compile. The biggest question every C++ developers always have uh, has is like, if I take this library from GitHub, how would I compile it in my environment with my compiler with, on like my operation system with all the options I need? So how do I do that? And uh, I think the part of success of the good libraries is when they have some instructions how to do that, or better have some like CMake files or something like that to compile. But luckily we have uh, some tools growing here. We have PC package, we have Conan, there's like also uh, NuGet on Windows, which you can use, so which try to help you and try to simplify this uh, simple step, actually, uh, if you think about it, like I want to use a library, say I want to use unit testing, I would like to take, say, Google Test, for example, for my project, how to take it. So with the um, dependency management uh, systems, you can do that. So, and now it comes to the uh, like other tooling, like to the IDE support. We added like VC package integration to C line. There is a VC package integration for Microsoft tooling. There is a Conan plugin for our tools as well. Um, so, like you can finally do that. The thing we learned while doing that, by the way, was that when we implemented the support for VC package and we started looking at the Conan plugin, which exists for several years by that time but uh, it was not like up to date with their recent Conan release. And we did a few like UX studies with our users and we realized that the people are using the package managers quite differently. And it's even if they use the same, say VC package, some of them are using the manifest mode, some of them are doing like some uh, other old style modes and it differs and we have to support all these modes uh, in the tooling uh, so that they, they have this flexibility. <laughs> Okay, talking about the other tooling, about the formatter. Um, this is kind of uh, important because I, I know quite many languages which has their standard formatting tooling, like say uh, Rust FMT is a standard formatting tool for Rust. So for C++, I guess everyone agrees that Clang format is kind of sta uh, standard tooling for us here. The interesting um, aspect about the Clang format is that being a standard tooling, it doesn't have the standard parser inside. It has the fuzzy parser. And that's done because it's, it has to be fast. It's the formatter tool. And it's not uh, utilizing the whole um, like clank parsing model. It has some fuzzy parser. So sometimes the formatter, uh, how the formatter behaves different from how the compiler behaves on your code. But I guess the people just got used to it. And they are like, when you try to format with the proper, um, say, clank compiler, uh, AST, they say, oh, no, no, this is incorrect. It should be different. So they just got used to that, but that's fine. Uh, the hardest part about the uh, Clang format is that they are quite often breaking the uh, compatibility between the versions. And I mean here that they sometimes have like some options which they do convert from text values, say, to enumeration. So to um, like some enum values in the options and the companies have either stay with some old Clang format version or upgrade all their Clang uh, configs and migrate to a new version. And quite often it's a pain. I mean, uh, when this kind of compatibility on the, on the level of the configuration of the tool differs, it's hard. It's not just about how it actually formats the code, but it's about how you configure it. Uh, Talking more about the code analysis tools, so uh, we ask people um, what, uh, what analysis tools they do rely on in their regular work. Uh, actually, there are two big groups of people. The people, 37% uh, who say that they simply rely on whatever tool their IDE provides, which puts some kind of a pressure on us as vendors. We have to you know, integrate with the uh, best-in-class tools so that the people are happy. And there are quite many people, uh, like one third of the respondents, who say that they're using none, uh, which is sad. Yep. Yeah, so there's a good um, command here that I'm missing some others. Actually, if you open the full report. 
yeah, uh, I'm missing the other, and I'm actually missing uh, quite many names here, just because it doesn't fit the slide. <laughs> if you open the report, you'll find all of them in the report, but I just like, it will be uh, one more room long. So there are quite many, but they usually like takes uh, just a few percentage. So, um, Generally, uh, interesting thing is that when we ask people when do they do the uh, code analysis, uh, it's not just uh, the people who, like quite many, nearly the half, just wait for the compiler to do the checks. So that, that's obvious, it's an easy way, right? So uh, it's good to see that there are quite many people doing that on the uh, CI CD and there are more um, like tools which work with the CI side of thing. And it's good to see. Uh, so this is like a good variety and there are like other options here. Uh, I wanted just to mention one, uh, one thing about the, first of all, the Clank Tidy, which is the most popular code analyzer right now in the uh, C++ um, community. And first of all, it's the baseline, it's the, the analyzer you can start with, yeah? So you can have others, but you just start with the basic checks from the Clank Tidy. It's easy, like it's, like it's free, it's uh, open to everyone, and there are many tools integrating with the Clank Tidy. But also, uh, it has some nice quick fixes for like modernizing your code or like to uh, make your code follow the core guidelines. But the good thing is that you can also customize it, right? So if you have some custom checks in your company, you can actually implement them on top of the Clank Tidy and then run this, for example, Clank Tidy custom version on your CI and see your custom checks. And this is great. So you have the great extension point here and you can make it applicable for like your specific code base. Uh, there is a very interesting other story here, uh, which we are a part of, and I'm really proud that we contribute to that, is the way to implement the data flow analysis for C++. And this is the way, actually, to, to catch these old, <laughs> but still existing issues like dangling pointers, lifetime issues, index out of bounds, unreachable codes, endless loop, whatever. So how it generally works, um, data flow analysis analyzes the possible values uh, like flowing through your code. It takes into account uh, the function parameters, uh, return values, field, and global variables. And it provides some output, and based on this output, the analyzer can like do some predictions. And <laughs> recently, I just want to share this nice example. We were like running the new version of our data flow analyzer on top of the Doom project like because it's a nice piece of code, right? So, and uh, we actually figured out that there is some nice array and it has some specific length and our analyzer finally showed us that the index may have a value 6 to 3, which is out of bounds. And then what could happen, we even created the example where we crushed them because of that, because there are literally index out of bound <laughs> issue in this code. And that's what you can find with the data flow analyzer. So you can do that. Uh, the power of the data flow analysis actually happens when you realize that it can start with a simple analysis inside the function scope. So just analyze how the you know, data flows inside the function. But it can be extended to the translation unit. So it can be cross-functional uh, functions analysis. But it can even be extended to the cross-translation unit analysis. That's not what we do, but I've seen the Ericsson proof of concept at some of the LLVM meetings. Uh, the conferences, they were presenting their tooling. It uh, it's utilizes some um, things implemented in, in Clank. So there is some API, um, how you build all these um, databases based on the compilation database, how you collect the data. So long story short, you can actually build this on top of the whole solution with the cross-translation unit analysis. In our tools, we only moved right now to the stage of the translation unit-wide analysis. We're not yet on the uh, final stage, but at least we know now that it's feasible, it's possible. Uh, a few short words about our other analyzers. So actually, except for the um, general C++ analyzers, there are lots uh, a lot of analyzers we have, which are specific for some DSL, which takes into account this like domain they are working for. Say you can use Clazy for acute, and it's nice to use Clazy for acute code because 
uh, if you take the journal like Clank Tidy Say, it will find you the major issues in C++. But if you would like the analyzer to take into account the signal concept, for example, from Qt, you take the Clazy and it actually does some nice analysis on top of that. There are similar things like Unreal Engine has uh, its own Unreal Header tool, which is very useful because the whole reflection model in Unreal Engine is based on macros. So um, when you're writing a real engine code, and we work a lot with the game dev developers because we do tools for them, they are usually struggling with these macros because these are pure macros, and they provide some text, uh, you know, um, substitutions there. But Unreal Header tool uh, actually can help them with uh, like spotting at least some issues in these uh, creepy macros. And of course, there are lots of various embedded checkers. I won't miss uh, like talk here about like Mistra and others which do some specific checks for the embedded. Um, I also wanted to um, note that code analysis on CI is a thing right now. And it's great because it's not that you postpone the checks, you know, from the compilation stage to the CI saying like, okay, let someone else find them later. No, it's about like how you do the code reviews or the pull requests, for example, or how you make sure that your open source project is like, um, healthy. I mean, you, you before applying, say, the uh, pull request, you can run some code analysis on some general CI and check if there are any possible issues. Also, on CI, you can target some platform-specific analysis, which possibly, which quite likely you can't maybe run on your local machine. And it's like, for example, not possible, but you can do that on CI for your target machines. And also you can do the like long and greedy checks, which take time and which you don't want to wait on your local machine. This all can be moved to the uh, CI CD. So it's some kind of a management tool. And uh, there are lots of tooling there, like there is uh, sonar source tools. And we also built Kadana in JetBrains. And with them, you can simply see this timeline, how your project kind of survives for the time through all these uh, checks and if it stays healthy or something going down and spots the, the point on time when like the quality started decreasing. Um, actually, there I even did a big talk at NDC Tech Town uh, last year and in C++ now in 2019 dedicated to the code analysis tooling and how we use them, what, what we have and what's possible there. And you can also learn about data flow analysis in details there. Um, the next tooling will be the unit testing. Uh, so actually, we, we are in quite good situation here in terms that we have quite many frameworks for unit testing in C++. And quite many C++ developers do uh, see the value in, the, in doing the unit testing, but not exactly the unit testing. So that's what we actually learned from doing the service. So when we asked people, are you doing the unit test? And they were like, oh, no, we are like, oh, you're not doing the testing. And then, oh no, we're doing the testing, but it's not the unit testing. You know, there are other different kinds of like performance or regression tests or whatever. Uh, but in terms of the unit testing, we have quite a good uh, family of tools. The Google test, which was always uh, from one side a pain to start using it, but from the other side, it, it's still the used by the majority of the C++ developers and also the C developers. Uh, the problem is that you always need to think how you compile that. So luckily, we now have like package managers approach, for example, when we can ask them to help. Catch was very, very popular. I guess it's still popular. Uh, I'm not sure um, how the community feels about that they moved from the header only to the um, library distribution model. So they were a header only framework until catch, uh, catch 2 uh, version 3. Uh, yeah, th that's their naming, like catch to version three is not a header uh, only um, unit testing framework anymore. Before that, you can just, in uh, you could just include catch uh, HPP file and you're ready to go. But because they saw uh, quite many users who requested some advanced and profound features, I guess that's where their reasoning to change the distribution and to avoid the overhead for everyone, simply moving with these uh, like advanced features in the header only framework. So, and yeah, but it's moving also to the new standards like Catch 2, I guess, is using C14, and there are like some um, tendency to move to C17. Now, Doc Test could be your next uh, popular unit testing framework if you still want to stay header only. 
and it uses uh, like some more than C++ features also. But like, yeah, there are, there are options um, you can use. Uh, also, talking about the, the variety, there are also, if you talk about the unit testing, there are also coverage tools which actually show you how many like lines or statements or branches, uh, sorry for the tuba, uh, branches in your code you actually covered. Uh, there are two major tools like uh, LVMCOF and GCOF, uh, which the people are mostly using. Interestingly, they behave differently, especially when you um, calculate the branch coverage you get different results with them. So uh, you have to be careful because sometimes developers are surprised that they kind of, they got the 100% coverage, then they run another tool and the coverage is different. It's like less than 100%. That's just because they uh, do the different type of calculation. And also uh, what affects the result is if you are using say exception handling, it also uh, affects the final results. Okay, finally. Uh, the uh, nearly the final slide before the references is like what we were talking here about. So first of all, do we have a standard tool set? Not in the sense, uh, like not as Swift or Rust say, like yeah, so we, we can't take just one compiler, one project model, and there are reasons for that. So uh, do we have commonly used tools for various use cases? Yes, the wish is good, so we can get more, and uh, there is a huge opportunities for some. Do we still miss some tools? Uh, say package manager, which is <laughs> more popular? Uh, probably yes. And we definitely can unify more. And there is this, uh, you've heard um, the effort uh, in the community to unify some things in the language to make um, like vendors life, uh, tooling life easier also among, among the other reasons. So we can do more unification and it will definitely help. And the story with the model has showed us clearly that the unification is important because it's not just about creating the language feature because before you come to the adoption, it's about the tooling. Yeah, and I guess that's uh, it. These are some references if you would like to, you know, to dive into some of these reports, talks and learn more about some data, and I'm ready to answer some questions. Thank you. Yep. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, talking about the profiling, yeah. So, um, actually, uh, I did a few demos yesterday at the booth uh, when I realized that the people uh, sometimes don't know about some very good basic default stuff. Actually, there is dtrace on macOS and there is perf on Linux, which are awesome. And there are like command line tools, but some tools like ours have the dedicated integration. So with them as a backend, so you can simply use them. Uh, so say if you take the C line, you can simply profile your code on Linux and macOS. We don't have something for Windows yet, though we uh, we have our own in-house profiler for .NET, which right now is uh, also getting the support for like C++ part. So maybe that will also come to the Windows platform uh, integrated into our tooling, and you can already use it in um, like in the ReSharper family of tools. So you can um, profile there. So yeah, there there are tools, and they are quite nice. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, the question was uh, if we plan to support Bazel and C-Line. Uh, tough question mostly for the booth, but I will answer from here. So we do have a Google plugin for Bazel because the Google was the main um, contributor and they are the most interested in Bazel. They have the plugin. The problem with the plugin was that at the time they created the plugin and they still support it. So it's a little bit behind the major release versions, but uh, it doesn't use the proper API because we didn't have one. So our plan for now is probably, uh, and we collaborated with Google about that already, we plan to rewrite it, but it will take some time because it's a unified plugin for C++, Java, and other languages and technologies. So for our tools, we need to kind of rewrite the whole plugin for all the technologies. So it will take some time, but uh, I hope that the new plugin for Bazel is coming because the old one has some issues. Yep. Do you think 
I would say even more. So the question was if the VC package uh, affects the CMake uh, adoption. I would say what actually affects the CMake adoption a lot is the Microsoft uh, collaboration with Kitware for sure. So they did the press sets, like VC package is like fully CMake. Uh, these all things do affect the adoption for sure because if you have the tooling around it, it helps. So yes, but like Conan also supports CMake, uh, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question was uh, about the um, MSVC and uh, like Microsoft tools which dominate the game dev and what is the source for that. I'll try to answer not to disclose quite many NDAs here, which I know. So first of all, yeah, it is the default tooling for game dev by now. Uh, part of the story is that um, all the language engines by default generate you the uh, solution files. That's part of their, I guess, agreement with Microsoft. Uh, console vendors do provide tooling based on like uh, Microsoft um, ecosystem as well. This is another part of the story. And also because all this happens on Windows historically, and no one, you know, do game dev development on Linux and Mac OS. If you ask these developers, they say, oh, like, no, what for? So we're all on Windows. So that's essential for them. That's fine. However, they have some things moving away from uh, ecosystems, say like PlayStation um, SDK is utilizing Clank. So, and there are other uh, movements in this direction. I still think they will stay uh, like highly dependent on Microsoft ecosystem for years, but uh, it has some movement uh, forward. So, and uh, they even have their own project models from which they simply generate say solution files and in our tooling, we do support uh, sometimes their native project models, like for Unreal Engine, we simply open the U project. So we simply you know, skip the step of the solution file generation. So it's possible, but uh, of course they contribute a lot to this ecosystem and it's historically very much dependent on Windows ecosystem. And even like all these SDKs, they are compiled with all these Windows headers. So it's essential uh, part. So I, I, I can't, uh, we can't affect it that easily or change it that easily, and maybe there is no reason to do that dramatically. So there are interesting, um, interesting uh, directions, uh, movements to the uh, to Clank in some tooling, and uh, so sometimes you can compile these all these things with Clank. Sometimes they utilize it to some extent. So we'll see how it goes, but it it will stay Microsoft dependent for a very long time being for sure. Other questions? Yep. Uh, plugins for C line, which I find useful. Okay, since I did um, eight years of my C++ development, most of the time I did in Vim. <laughs> so, uh, idea Vim plugin is probably my favorite one. But if you start with the tooling, I would recommend you the plugin which we called Key Promoter X which will be showing you the shortcut you have to use instead of the mouse movement every time you will be using the mouse. <laughs> uh, it's key promoter X or key promoter. So you can search by the, if you go to plugins, chatbrains.com and just search for something like key promoter or search from the ID, you'll find one. Okay, other questions? If not, then thank you very much, and you're welcome to the booth. <laughs>